Hi, I'm Tyler, and this is the Fox Valley Film Critics. In this episode of the show, we're going to be continuing our breakdown in the AFI's Top 100 Films with their next film, The Maltese Falcon, as well as the newest big superhero movie, Deadpool 2. Stay tuned. Welcome to the show, brought to you by Groove Think Productions and FETV. Joining us once again is our show's regular editor, Terry. Hello. How's it going, man? Good. It's going good. Yeah, fist bump, yeah. handshake, whatever. Ter <laughs> there we go. We'll meet in the middle. So we've been out on the road for the last couple of weeks. We did two episodes of what I call Fox Valley Film Critics, Critics by the Fire. Yes. And then we did one episode at the Hollywood Palms and one episode at the Hollywood Boulevard, who were all kind enough to host us. And now we're back at the studio, and it feels good to be here. It's been like two months, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah, sometimes this old studio, what is that uh, John Denver song with? Sometimes this old farm feels just like home, but the old studio feels just like home. It's, it's nice to be home. Yep, new posters. And new everything, right? <laughs> yeah. So Maltese Falcon, huh? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, so we were, talk we were talking about it a little bit before the show. Yeah, directed by uh, John Houston and starring one of my favorite old-timers, of all well, Humphrey Bogart. Bogey. Yeah, the Bogues, you know. And I think I, I wanted to, I didn't get a chance to do the research, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, this might have been one of his first serious roles where he was cast as a lead because before that yes. they only casted him as a bad as a bad guy because of his famous snarl. He, they thought he didn't have a face to be a lead, yeah, like was, hero character. This was before the age of the uh, the ugly hot actor like the Marlon Brando's yeah. and Clint Eastwood's, yeah, where you could get away with having crooked teeth and weird face because suddenly now that made you the bad boy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, th yeah, this movie, uh, and it was great to cast Humphrey Bogart and, and uh, Dashiell Hammett. He was, wrote the novel. Uh, well, you said you read the novel. Yeah, so. I read the novel, yeah. So it was great to cast uh, Humphrey Bogart as the hard-boiled uh, private detective Sam Spade. I think he did a, he did a great job and uh, played really true to uh, the way that uh, Hammett wrote the character in the, in the film and everything. So like to, and uh, the plot of the film is also, it's, it's Total noir. I mean, it's noir like down to its very like the marrow of its bones and everything. It starts with the, the 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 femme fatale who we don't know is a femme fatale yet coming in and requesting their services about and she, you know lies about what's going on and you can tell that they don't really trust it and then from there there's a murder and then it's just all the dominoes and then the chips start falling and it just all leads up to the big the big mystery and everything that gets solved at the end. I think it, it plays out really well too. Well, it, it, the casting Bogey in that role is brilliant, too, because, as you said, he'd only played villains. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of the opposite of what Billy Wilder did with, uh, Fred, I think it was Fred Astaire in The Double Indemnity. Okay. Where it's, he, we had an actor who played only good characters suddenly being cast into a role that makes him corrupt, that corrupts him as a character. So you have him in a role, and you're casting him as a good guy, and he's just running around uh, San Francisco uh, emotionally abusing women and... Yelling at people, and he's he's borderline a villain almost. Yeah, it, 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 not even necessarily in a modern sense by like then standards too. Because mm -hmm. he, he's clearly he's he's clearly in it for himself. Like he he his minor spoiler in the first five minutes, his partner's killed, and he doesn't even flinch. He's just like, oh, my partner's killed. That's a darn shame, right? Yeah, there. I'm gonna find out who. It is. The only reason he's really going after them for doing it is because he has a moral code, not because he it's necessarily the right thing to do, it's because it's his right thing to do. And at the end of the day, it all, everything ultimately boils down to them trying on this artifact hunt where, I mean, first, in the opening title of the film, they have this Indiana Jones, Star Wars-esque title crawl where you find out about the Maltese Falcon, mm -hmm. the, most va like the most valuable archaeological artifact in the history of the world. It's like a, it's a little bird covered entirely in jewels and if they can find it, they'll basically become like the richest person on the planet. And it's this movie is it, 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 you can kind of see how this movie predates a lot of the uh, uh, the adventure films of the '70s and '80s, like Indiana Jones and stuff like that, like even a little bit. But this is definitely a noir. And apparently, a lot of people cite this as the first noir. I, I don't know if I would entirely agree with that because I've heard some people talk about how the movie doesn't entirely con conform with noir. You never see like the uh, uh, 
the windows with the, the shades drawn. You never see that at, at all in the film. But it definitely has the prototype elements of the noir film. So it's hard-boiled detective and the femme fatale and everyone's a bad guy, essentially. Yeah, so it has, has those elements, but I don't think it... This is definitely the prototype version of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think you really see like actual... Yeah, no war until double, double indemnity. And the but. good the good thing about like with that too, it makes it even more like we were talking about is the plot twist because you know it's like first you're like okay, am I watching a murder mystery? But everything like the murder, the whole her hiring them at the beginning, it all ties into the Maltese Falcon and, and with going in with the noir theme too, it's the the evil henchmen that pop out at every corner. You know, Peter Lorre as uh, Joel Cairo, um, and that's one of my favorite scenes of the whole movie when uh, it's like you know you got. Peter. I will point out on the map, this is Peter Lorre. Yes. And they also, they all, uh, appropriately, they were together in Casablanca, and they did, uh, Bogey and Lorre did tons of movies afterwards. Yes, because they, they actually worked really well together. The thing that I like in uh, one of my favorite scenes in Maltese Falcon is when you first meet Peter Lorre, and he tries to muscle up on, uh, on Sam Spade, and he, like, you know, tries to search him and everything, and just that... That whole scene is great when he grabs his, when he grabs his hand and he just kind of looks at him and he's like gives him the look like you know you've messed up right and he just cold cocks him and <laughs> knocks him right out. They, they kind of have like an odd couple deal where he like yeah he, like Bogart is like se like incredibly charismatic and Laurie is just like kind of sniveling yeah. in every single movie mm -hmm. he's in he's yeah like, you can tell he's not in charge of anything no. No, but yeah, it's a, um, I think the movie, um, like, so, like we were talking about a little bit earlier too, and I, I think the movie is still a great movie today. Um, you have to get past kind of the, I guess, the overt sexism in it, because <laughs> as, as they say with like Beth uh, Bethesda, is it a is it a feature or a glitch? And the yeah. answer is yes. Yes, yeah, hey, this absolutely. Is, this is noir. Everyone's a bad guy. Every man beats women, and every woman is like doing all the horrible things. Yeah. So. And it's funny, like you said, with uh, Bogart being close to a villain, I think that's what makes his character really great in this, too, is that he's human. He's not, uh, a lot of times when you get the hero movies, you know, they're infallible, they have this, but he's not. He's a boozer, he's a womanizer, and he, he really, like you said, he cares only about himself. He doesn't, like, you, his, his, not only was his partner killed and he didn't bat an eye, but in the very next scene, his wife comes into the office and they're kissing each other. And she's asking him, and she even goes as far as to ask if he killed her husband so he could be with her. And he just kind of laughs about it, like, oh, that's rich, you know, like, it's, yeah, so it's, it's just like, um, I lost my train of thought there. But yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's a just like, it's, like I said, it's, it's great that, uh, it's just a great movie. So did you know this is the third version that they, the Hollywood tried to adapt of the Maltese Falcon? I did not know that. Yes, um, I have the wonderful DVD set that's very old. And if you go on to the second disc, it comes with the other two adaptions of it. So the 1931 Maltese Falcon and Satan Met a Lady, which are both completely different styles of movies. Oh. And John Huston, who directed this, hated both of them because they both kind of play up different aspects of the, the Sam Speeder character. And like one of, they're basically, they're almost like thin man ask romantic comedies. Okay. So they have, they, they aren't. They are. They aren't taking it as seriously because they don't. They, at this point, hardboiled noir was not, or hardboiled detective thrillers weren't a movie thing yet. This yeah. kind of this, this kind of set that up, and it set up Bogart's career, and it set up basically everyone's in career. And it's actually John Huston's first foray into Hollywood. I mm -hmm. think his first movie, which is kind of like, wow. <laughs> yeah, right. For a first movie to make something that could be considered one of the top 100 in a classic for years. I mean, he's done multiple of those. I think. I mean, he did African Queen. I, I can't remember everything John Huston's done, but he's he has his name on a lot. So then, so Bogart with Bogey was basically uh, like a staple of John Huston, kind of like Christopher Guest using like oh, the yeah. same casting characters type of deal. Okay. Yeah, that was that was a deal in old Hollywood. I mean, like John Ford had uh, Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne. So like, you, you, if you. You made friends, there was, nepotism was rampant. Oh, sure. It still is rampant, and sure. you haven't noticed. Yeah, absolutely. No, I haven't. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, um, so get, we digress. Uh, <laughs> to go back to the, the film and everything, yeah, so it's, so the whole, the whole thing, the title of the film, Maltese Falcon, yeah, they're looking for that piece of, um, they're looking for that statue that supposedly, because um, what was the story? It was like, it was crushed in jewels, but they painted it, it to look nice, like lead to it was, make it. It was the Knights Templar. Uh, crafted this as a gift to the king of Spain. Okay. And it got stolen by pirates and just kind of wound up floating around for like half, yeah. of, half a millennia. And now supposedly it's going to wind up in San Francisco and in the, the main crime boss who, he was in Casa, uh, I think it's, 
I think it's that guy from Casablanca, actually. I think it is, actually. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I forget his name, but he's he wants the Maltese Falcon. I don't exactly remember the meeting because there's a lot of talking in this movie. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, it's it's it's. This is one of those movies where you can fall into the pit of you missed one line of dialogue and you're lost for a significant yes. portion of the movie. It's like Big Sleep or another one of those um, bogey talking movies. Mm -hmm. but, um, I don't exactly remember what he wanted it for, but uh, I think he was just a rich man. Yeah, that, he just, wanted, I, he just, just want, wanted it, right? Like like the rich collect weird stuff, and to him that was like the ultimate trinket to have. I think is what it was. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to reveal the final reveal of the Maltese Falcon because I think that that's it's pretty clever and it plays sure. into it plays into the fact that these are all selfish people that are bad and they lust after things, and obviously that's yeah. that part of the th the theme, but. I think I think Bogey ends ultimately ends up doing better specifically simply, specifically because he ends up following his own code and crafting something for himself mm -hmm. as opposed to everyone else. And it, like you said, with following his own code, it's his code. And and the part that I really like about the movie too is it's like you have to ask yourself: Does he have it figured out from the very get go? Because it seems like he like or does he figure it out at the end? And I mean, it's great how he figures it out. He figures out who everybody is and that and how he's been played and everything, which also adds to the film itself because it's not just them going after it. It's, it's the way he's, as a detective, detecting what's going on and figuring it out. That's all the time we have for this segment. Uh, join us for the next segment where we'll be discussing Deadpool 2. Stay tuned. Does this help at all? Anything helps, ma'am. Just try to get some sleep now. I can't sleep. Yeah, me neither. I'm on my way. Hello and welcome back. So, Deadpool 2. As some of our more observant fans may have noticed, I've been wearing a hat this entire time. And I won this at the Avengers Infinity War screening last month at the Hollywood Boulevard, thanks to Grand Parker Comics. And they were giving away these hats. That, and I won it by knowing that Rob Liefeld co-created Deadpool. And then when I went to the Deadpool screening this week, I won another one for my friend by telling her who, that the Fantastic Four were the first Marvel comics, and that's not relevant to the movie. I just wanted to brag because <laughs> I out nerded a room full of nerds twice and won a pair of hats. Kudos! So, yeah, I'm so proud of myself. But anyway, you said you liked the movie. I did. I I did not have a chance to review this yet, so this is my first foray really into public talking about it. I am not huge on this movie. Like, I I would consider it tepid, and I would consider it as a movie that fundamentally missed the point of the first movie. But let's let me let's hear your thoughts on it first. What I, liked, what I liked about the movie is it was still Deadpool, so they didn't change that. I, I know with uh, everything going on with the whole Marvel license, I was worried that this was they were going to tone down uh, Deadpool, but I like the fact that he's still the wisecracking assassin and everything. Um, and I also like the fact, too, that they made it, uh, not to give away anything, but it's it's... Kind of a, it's a different take on where it's like a, it's a coming of age story, even though Deadpool's already Deadpool. He kind of, at the end of the film, it takes him like this whole, like what Deadpool does, killing people left and right and trash talking everybody and even his friends <laughs> and everything to realize, um, to realize something significant and profound and actually change him as a character, like help him to evolve into something more than just a mindless killing machine because from the first part of the film, without giving away any spoilers, something happens that is basically going to turn him into a mindless killing machine that he doesn't care anymore. But he has to, like, he's got kind of has a fall from grace if Deadpool was ever in a state of grace <laughs> from what he does. Sure. And uh, I, I would note that we briefly had, uh, when we did our shoot, we, I got a little bit of behind the scenes info on the Fox deal. Uh, 20th Century Fox is not Disney's until next year. Oh, okay. And it might not even go through because Comcast is trying to outbid them. Oh, but, okay. So it's possible that, that that deal might not even happen at all. So anything that they currently have in production, it's not going to be changed. Oh, like, okay. The next X-Men movie is not going to change. They're still going to make X-Force probably. <sighs> They're still probably going to make Gambit, and that just makes me want to die. But, just like, why? But, 
So, yeah, no, there's not going to be a change to Deadpool, and if it does go to Disney, they're not going to do that. Okay. They'll, they'll probably just keep it as an R-rated thing and maybe throw in an Avenger here and there if they do keep it the same. But, like, I, my thoughts on this film were slightly more on the controversial side, I guess. Okay. In that I saw it as a far more cynical marketing exercise. And I don't, not, I'm not anti that, necessarily. I just think that... The first movie functions as kind of counter-programming to the regular superhero movies. It's not a great movie. It's not, it's not like, perfect. It's, it's a really good, nasty kind of little bit of vice that's supposed to be kind of refocus how the big superhero multi-film universes are bloated and they're hard, they're hard to follow. And Deadpool kind of exists to kind of to take the, take the piss out on it just to unleash a little, release a little steam and just to laugh at it. Mm-hmm. It's a movie that's just, that's, it's, it's a simple love story that's trying to have fun at the expense of all these movies. I think that that's, it, it, it was kind of healthy at that moment to have that because Batman vs. Superman was about to come out and we would all hate it and Civil War would come out later that year and it's pretty good but it's, it's a convoluted yeah. movie that's hard to follow at times. It's creating all this lore nonsense. And if you're not super invested in the comic books, like I am, like a lot of people are, then Deadpool is kind of a great counter-programming for that, where it's a movie that's just about letting, having, having a laugh at all the nonsense. Mm-hmm. And Deadpool 2 decides that the, the logical area to take that with is to embrace the nonsense unabashedly and to try to craft it into like a, a strict superhero movie. And I'm just like, that kind of misses the point of Deadpool. And I'm, I'm open to the idea that this could be done. I'm open to the idea that you can make a Deadpool movie that skirts the line by doing a perfectly conceived normal superhero movie where Deadpool is just prancing along the sides of it and driving the story in weird ways, kind of like maybe like a Pirates of the Caribbean deal. But I don't think that they kind of had the chops to do that because I, th- I think it's uh, Justin Leach who was, the dire- who was yeah. one of the co-directors of John Wick. Although I would argue not the be- not the better of the two, because the other one just went on to make John Wick two, mm-hmm. and then this guy went on to direct Atomic Blonde, which I've been told is good, but does not. I- I've also heard is very average compared to John Wick two. So with this, I, there was a lot of things I liked about it. I, th- I think basically every performance was excellent, like especially Josh Brolin, because he absolutely refu- he's one of those actors that absolutely refuses to give a bad performance no matter what movie he's in. Yeah. So he just plays the. Um, damaged super soldier with that with a mission of revenge he plays it super straight and tries to find the pathos in that and it's clear he's not trying to make it like like a joke mm-hmm. i mean he he's he's playing it perfectly straight this is like no country for old men to ask serious like levels of taking taking a a delivery of a, of a line of a character seriously but it doesn't I, I don't think it necessarily adds something like i know the kid does really good too he mm-hmm. was in a Hunt for the Wilder People, the Wilder People, which was Taika Waititi's last film before Thor Ragnarok. Okay, and he was great in that. He's great in this, but I, I, I just don't think the movie is does a good job of skirting the, uh, the, the line between having a character who's completely flippant and doesn't shouldn't care about anything that's going on, and a movie that's trying to have an actual serious message about bigotry and stuff like and people who actually are suffering in society. So it's, it's a really weird balance. And it could be done. I know it can be done because a couple of these X-Men movies have done it. And, but I, don't, I, I just don't think it, think it kind of trips up multiple times and it doesn't quite hit it. Although I will say the X-Force scene was probably a, oh, like, was the, the funniest yeah. scene. Peter, it, right, Peter? Poor Peter. Yeah. yeah. Was, <laughs> it was like, like you know, I'm not going to like, spoil what happens to Peter. <laughs> but you're rooting for him all the way up into that part. You're like, all right, Peter. And then, Go, yeah. Peter! <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then, I mean, and the, the whole thing about that, though, is like what I like about it, too, with uh, what I liked about it was um, it still it didn't lose its humor. I, like, I know you said what it was trying to do, and I, and I think I get your point. I, I'm, not I'm not going to contest the humor because the humor is fine. It's very lowbrow, but it's fine. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it, I, I was laughing throughout the movie, so... Yeah, and I, I think with what you were saying, I, I don't know, maybe it's Marvel's way because of trying to get Deadpool to fit into the Marvel Universe, which is, like you said, kind of... This is the Fox movie, so it's the X-Men Universe. Okay, so the X-Men Universe, so um, which is kind of what you said might make it counterproductive because in the comics, Deadpool is his own man. He's basically just 
does his own thing, doesn't care what anybody thinks. And Well, there's a, a lot of great Deadpool comics are about him jumping in other people's stories and essentially just being like a... Uh, like a nuisance kind yeah, of. Yeah, a nuisance. Yeah, yeah just kind of... Well, like the, and that's like the whole relationship with him and uh, Cable. Tight, uh, Cable, but uh, Colossus and all that too, where Colossus is like so hell-bent on being good. Like, it, and he, he doesn't even swear, which... Spoiler alert, there's a funny moment at the end where he finally gets Colossus to swear, and it's actually kind of funny. But he doesn't even swear, and he's trying to show Wade, like, the, like even in the, from the first Deadpool, he's, like, trying to show him, like, you can be good, you can be good. And Wade's like, why be good when it feels, like, why be good when it feels so much better to be bad? He's like, I just like being bad, you know? It's like, it's like Colossus is, like, superhero slash mom slash babysitter to Deadpool, and it, how are there not like a thousand cops chasing Deadpool constantly? Like, I don't know. Yeah, he, I know. This, he clearly has a culturally refer, like right? understandable identity. Right. So I know. I mean, hell, they uh, they arrest, they put Hancock in jail, and all he did was cause millions of dollars in property damage. <laughs> Deadpool's a murderer. <laughs> well, maybe he's murdering like bad guys. So there's maybe there's a yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe the maybe the X Men universe has a well, no, it doesn't because X Men universe is the one where the government is always doing bad things to people for who are doing good things. So. Yes. So Deadpool is apparently immune to that because he's not technically a mutant, but but he he was like a regular human who had who had the mutant gene, but it wasn't active until so. the, yeah until he was tortured into it becoming active and everything. So, so. it's not it's not really it, that's almost more like an Inhuman, which I would not expect anyone to understand what that mm-hmm. means because the Inhuman show was terrible. But yeah, um, yeah. So his powers it it, would, it doesn't have the same metaphor to him. So yeah, he's just, he just he just has immortality now for right. because. He was experimented on, so. And even though she didn't have as big of a role in it, in this one as the first one, um, she was still there, but uh, I think Meg- Negasonic, is it with an N or an M? Meg- uh, Megasonic T.A. Did forehead. You, or it might be Negasonic. I don't, that's a good question, actually. But her whole, when she came in, and like, she, and like I, I get the whole thing, it's just so great the way that she's like the typical angsty teenager and uh, how Deadpool pokes and prods at that because like she has a girlfriend in this, which is just, like, I, like, when I saw that she had a girlfriend, it was like, I, was just, I almost yelled out in the theater, of course! I was like, it may, but I just love it how she's so, like, whatever, and like, the, just the relationship between the three of them with how they are always, like, talking so mean to each other, but then you bring the girlfriend in, and he's just like, I forget what her name was, like, Yukio Kyoko, or, or Yukio, and he's just like, hi, Yukio, and she's like, hi, wait. <laughs> it's just, it just, like. They're, like, opposites. Like, yeah, she's, like, it, the it's super hysterical. Happy and... Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I definitely, it, I liked it. And I think anybody, I, I would recommend seeing that movie. It's a, probably one of a good summer blockbuster. So one of the good summer action hero blockbusters. Okay, so we have like a Cicely Neighbor thing. Right? Yes. He, he gave it a thumb. Yeah, it's a one thumb up, one thumb down. <laughs> uh, that's all the time for this segment. Join us for the final segment where we'll have the movie recommendation for this week. Stay tuned. Back to our final segment. We're going to hand things over to Terry now for the movie recommendation of the week. Hello. So I uh, rummaging through my old DVD collection, and uh, it's I, this was actually sitting on the top. Um, and with uh, everything, oh. with the way the zombie has come into culture, I'm going to pick Don, George A. Romero's uh, 1978 classic, Dawn of the Dead. Um, may I? Yes, you may. I've had that forever. The Ultimate Edition. It's got all different kinds of versions, but. Um, so I was looking through that. I was looking through it because I'm like, oh, let me pick, see what movie I can pick. And, and I haven't seen it in a while. And it, the, what was interesting is I looked in that movie. It's almost uh, May 25th of 1979 is when it was released. So it is almost 30 years since its release. Wow. Um, and it's probably one of the best ones. Like Night of the Living Dead is a classic by far because it was the first George A. Romero. It was the first mainstream like zombie movie. And um, But I think Dawn of the Dead was more his magnum opus. Like, Day of the Dead was more like, Day of the Dead is when he had a bigger special effects budget, so there was a lot more gore and viscera. This was, 
more smartly done, I think. And I think this was more of a full zombie movie than Night of the Living Dead. I mean, Night of the Living Dead shot on a shoestring budget. He had a little bit more money here. Um, and Walking Dead is like, like I said, the zombie's still in culture. Walking Dead has helped do that. It helped put the zombie back into pop culture. But we had, it's been a long time since we've actually had an actual zombie movie where you go and sit down in the theaters. I know they tried to remake the Dead series in like the early 2000s. With they constantly a, remake the Dead movies. Like yeah, there was a Day of the and, Dead movie this last year. So. Mm -hmm, and they're just not that good. They just miss, like some of them are okay, you know, the zombie. It, it seems like they're focusing more on the zombies, whereas what made George A. Romero so great is he focused uh, more on the people. Because like the whole this Dawn of the Dead, it, yes, it had zombies, but the whole uh, hidden meaning of it was our obsession with consumerism. They hide out in a shopping mall. They take stuff that they don't need. They go, in, they go into stores because, you know, nobody's there and they're gathering all these items into shopping carts to, that they don't need to survive. It's just there to take. Big TVs, it's like, hey, you know. They nope. get bored with it really fast. Yeah, 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 and they do, and they get bored with it really fast. And, you know, and, and the same thing with the zombies. They get into the mall or they're around the mall, but for some reason they're all, it's like, it's like a reflection of us. They're mindlessly through the mall going up to the store windows and and they got that really silly music that's playing yeah yeah, dun, yeah dun, like yeah dun, dun, the, dun, the, it the sounds like mall music. music yeah absolutely and it's um and again you know it's got it's just got great uh really awesome death scenes like the zombies would you know you always got to have that but again it like any smart zombie movie they always said any smart zombie movie zombies are in the background the foreground of any smart zombie movie is how people are. And George A. Romero is, I think, deserves all the credit for that because he was one of the first ones that actually put that into the zombie culture where it's like, yeah, the zombies are something, but look how people are when I, society collapses. I will say, I like Romero quite a bit. I haven't seen everything he's done yet, but I want to do like a deep dive into his films mm -hmm. soon. Although I'm always, everything I've heard about him behind the scenes, I'm always a little bit unsure about how purposeful everything is because a lot of the way it sounds like is a lot of, the themes he comes up with in his movies tend to be products of editing as opposed to products of intent. Okay. Like Night of the Living Dead, like the way that they, uh, the main, they only, the only reason people talk about it as a civil rights movie is because they, the, because the main character's black. They only cast him because he was the best actor they could find. Which yeah. Is, which is great from, from a perspective, progressive standpoint. It's like, they, you just hired him on merit. And it was like, yeah. But it wasn't like specifically, it was meant to be a civil rights movie. But, but yeah, this is a great, I've been wanting to find this for a long time, but because it's like a hundred fifty dollar box set on eBay. So if you ever find one, definitely find, definitely buy it because it's really rare. That's all the time we have for this episode of the Fox Valley Film Critics. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at AntisocialCritic. That's critic without the C at the end of it. You can find more of my written reviews at theantisocialcritic.tumblr.com and Geeks Under Grace. And you can find more uh, past episodes of the show on the Group Think Productions YouTube page. I'm Tyler with the Fox Valley Film Critics. Have a wonderful day.